is Spectrum. Alternative Myths. Homeopathy. Secret Society. Hypnosis. The Paranormal. Alternative Energy. UFO. Abduction. The Weird. The Wild. And the Wonderful. With your hosts, Tom Theophanis and Scott Jordan. Hello, good evening, and welcome to Spectrum Radio Network on BBS Radio 2. I'm Scott Jordan here, my co-host, Tom Theophanis, and remember, there's no such thing as too much information. Hey, Tom, how you doing? Hey, Scott, how are you? Good. Good, 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 good. Tonight's guest is Wade Frazier, who was groomed as a scientist from an early age, became fascinated by the subject of alternative energy when he was a teenager. As is so often the case with those with a clearly envisioned life mission when so young, his life path then was propelled him through a series of far-hitting experiences that qualified him to be one of the preeminent writers on the subject today. Wade's website, aheoplanet.net, comprises of over 1,200 of deeply thought-out, intelligent, and well-informed commentary on a number of the most important issues of our time. His direct personal experiences include working shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder for a number of years with Dennis Lee, who he describes as the Indiana Jones of free energy. Wade attests that Lee's larger-than-life experiences, many of which Wade witnessed at first hand, were authentic and occurred just as he reports it on his site. Welcome back. Wade, how are you? Hi. Hey, Good. Wade. How you doing? Hi, guys. It's Thanks nice for to having talk. me on. Yeah, it's nice to talk to you again. It's nice to talk to you again. Uh, I think uh, you were back uh, on a show a couple weeks ago, and uh, you were talking about all the various uh, free energy product, uh, projects you were either involved with or you're aware of uh, uh -huh. back in the time. Uh, what was the what was the time period there? Um, I mean, well, it, it stretches a couple decades, but I yeah, yeah yeah. So you know, my introduction was in '74, I would say, and then my hot and heavy days with Dennis Lee were '86 to '89, and then I did an encore. Uh, kind of performance with him back in 96, 97. And, um, you know, and then I was actually New Energy Moon with Brian O'Leary, you know, 2003 and four. So I, I've kind of come and gone. Okay. So just a, a quick bullet point, because we've already gone through uh, a lot of your history in the first interview. But for the listeners that haven't, uh, haven't heard your previous interview, if you could just go through a quick bullet point of where you started, what got you interested in in this area, and uh, and where you went from there. Okay. Well, thanks. Um, so, real briefly, I was you know, I was essentially raised uh, and groomed to be a scientist um, when I was uh, 16 years old. Uh, my first professional mentor invented what was considered the world's best engine for powering an automobile. Uh, and then that's when I got my kind of dreams of changing the um, world of energy. Uh, then, you know, working you at age 16. You know, anyway, when I was, uh, and again, I had some kind of strange experiences that changed my studies from science to business, became a CPA. In 1986, I had a, um, another series of strange circumstances that landed me in a company that was making a heat pump. Um, a, kind of a super heat pump that uh, saved about 80% of uh, somebody's heating costs. And that was this guy named Dennis Lee, met here in Seattle in 86. And then that's kind of when it got wild. And so for the next three years, uh, uh, I was involved with Dennis. And in fact, uh, we ended up in my hometown of Ventura, California. And that original engine that you know, I was introduced to at age 16, we were trying to marry that with the panels from Dennis's heat pump. Uh, this is now 1988. And uh, anyway, that's when they sort of lowered the boom on us. And so anyway, that was, that's, that were those years. And so then I was, you know, survived the experience, kind of left the field, did, did a lot of the, began the research and writing that became my site today. And then in 96, uh, Dennis, uh, after a couple of stints behind bars, convinced me to go back to work with him again and we did and we were pursuing we were pursuing you know free energy once again but we were also involved with uh, Browns and, and Browns gas um, and in fact back up a little bit back when I was uh, with Dennis back in the late 80s and 90 
also became aware of Sparky Sweet uh, and his his technology that was he was doing it right down the road from where we were in Ventura. Uh, and then over the years, I've become uh, aware of people like Adam Trombley, uh, these kind of people. And then when I was with Dennis in 96, 97, uh, he was busy uh, promoting Brown's Gas, uh, not so much as an alternative energy technology, but Brown's Gas uh, produces low energy nuclear reactions, which can transmute radioactive materials. Um, and then also during those years, uh, one of my close uh, fellow travelers uh, got the underground exotic technology show from the people that run the world. And uh, it became evident that all, all the things that I'm aware of and what the independent researchers are working on are very primitive compared to what's been developed right. in the above black world. And those, those, that, that show it didn't involve uh, a, a big collection of previous inventions that were stored in the basement of an underground base. Those were um, back-engineered alien technology type of uh, the, the stuff that hundreds just... and hundreds of years beyond what you could imagine, right? Yes, this, the, the stuff that was demonstrated certainly was not, you know, some sequestered inventor's stuff. This was, this was the good stuff that had been developed in, you know, multi-billion dollar settings, you know, with uh, above black, above, you know, top secret kind of black ops world technology developed, you know, 30th generation beyond the stuff that, you know, us free energy inventors and businessmen are working on. So, yeah, yeah. no, it's, so, we, yeah, we got a little show, you know, of, of uh, uh, I didn't, but a close friend did, and they got a show of the good stuff. So, yeah, yeah, that can really, you know, why oh, are we spending all our time in the, you know, in the lab or the basements or whatever working on this? And here they mm -hmm. got that, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. And 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 again, one of the upshots of that whole thing was was that they weren't uh, demonstrating to taunt this person; they were demonstrating to encourage this person. And they would certainly like to bring this stuff out, but the climate is not safe to do that. So, that was I, I, in the end, I got encouragement from that. There are competing interests. Oh, that's what I'm saying. So the, the people who are demonstrating it definitely aren't the people calling the big shots. Right, right. They want to see this stuff come out, but yep. they know that the, the battle is all uphill against yes. the, the economic uh, uh, tycoons. Yeah, they are not about to defy, uh, as Greer calls them, Godzilla. <laughs> right, right. Don't take Godzilla on in a, on his own island. Um yeah. Okay, so that, that's a good breakdown of, of your history and where you come from. Now I want, I want to sort of drill down a bit. Tom, do you have a question? Well, I, I want to, for a way to, to, to give us a little bit more on the specifics. Um, okay. Say Sparky Sweets. Yeah, like Sparky Sweets. And and what, what is it, when you say a Sparky Sweet device, what does uh -huh. that mean? Um, so Sparky, and um, in fact, there's there's a there's quite a bit of information out there on Sparky. Uh, Sparky was uh, worked his career at General Electric. He was a scientist. His specialty was magnetics, and um, in fact, uh, again, Bearden has been trying to reproduce Sparky's work for a long time. I think unsuccessfully, but he's been definitely attempting to do that. And Sparky retired as uh, again a career scientist at General Electric. Uh, playing around with magnetics down there in Los Angeles. And uh, essentially, and again, depending on who you talk to, it, it seems like he stumbled onto a variation of what's called the Casimir effect and was able to create, if you will, almost a, a standing wave magnetically uh, that was able to amplify currents. And, and a one, one of the uh, measures of his device had it producing a million times as much energy as went into it. And uh, in wow. fact, yeah, and it was, and then unfortunately Sparky, actually Sparky created several working prototypes and mailed them off to the big energy institutions, you know, thinking that he was now going to become. Yeah, his name, would, his name would be in lights and they yeah, throw a ticker tape parade for him. Yeah. All of that stuff, exactly. And, um, well, the opposite happened. And, and, but Sparky being this kind of pillar of the establishment guy, 
he got the FBI involved in his harassment. And I mean, he was and he, and he kept trying to work with the big institutions. He still even though, you know, they he got stonewalled pretty much. He, he kept trying. And but um, I, guess, I guess, he, guess he figured if he kept trying, eventually they'd see his logic. <laughs> Maybe, you know, and uh, except he eventually fled into hiding in the Mojave Desert the week before he died because of the threats. They they basically gave him an ultimatum. And my God, Sparky was like 85 years old at the time. And so, uh, you know, he had a pretty rough ride and a pretty rough end there. And uh, but he's one of the more, you know, really famous because actually Bearden was, uh, you know, Bearden was around a lot of the theory of this stuff, and I think yeah. Sweet was probably the first guy with the goodies you know, that Bearden kind of stumbled into, and they spent a lot of time testing that, and in fact, I believe it produced anti-gravity effects also. Yeah, and, wasn't uh, that the, I, I think I remember a story that, um, I don't know if it was Sparky or not, but somebody had called Bearden and, and said, you know, uh, that he, they were having some difficulty, and Bearden said, well, why don't you try this and this, and, and he tried it, and he said, now, you know, be careful, don't give it too much power, because that thing will shoot up through the roof, right? And uh, and the guy said, okay, yeah, I won't do that, I won't do that, I'll just do half power or something. And then the guy called them, a, you know, a while later, and eventually admitted to Bearden, uh, I had to try it, I had to. So he, he pumped it up to full full power and it went up through the roof or something. <laughs> you know, I've heard this one. I don't think that was Sparky. I oh. believe Sparky's was a pretty controlled experiment where they actually had it on a scale and it oh, okay. got and it got lighter. It kept getting lighter as they cranked it up. So <clears throat> Wow. Any, anyway, um yeah, but it was so Sparky stuff was uh, uh he had he had the stuff. He had the goods. Yeah. Uh at the same time though, and this is one of the problems with the inventors like a Sparky is that I mean, he wrote a textbook on trying to describe the physics behind it, et cetera. And, but, but and this is how to say it. Where Sparky was, he was on the frontiers of this stuff, at least, you know, for the freelance inventor types. And he wasn't exactly sure what was happening all the time. I mean, some of his prototypes would just stop working. And right, you never, right. you never figured out. Or when ice would form on it, when it would run. I mean, that was, I remember when he demonstrated to somebody close to me and he, and he was like, and here's the damnedest thing. Watch this, you know. So there was still a lot of mystery mm -hmm. uh, about exactly what was going on. But uh, Sparky, though, apparently came up with a way of conditioning his Magnus to achieve the effect. And he took that to his grave with him, how to oh. do that. So that was one of the... Um, that's and that's, a shame. That's too common also, I'm yeah. afraid. Well, Bearden probably knows a little bit about it. Oh no, it, Bearden, it, Bearden has been trying to reproduce it ever since, and so, um, and I don't, I, I don't think anybody's pulled it off, at least in, in our white world, you know, of right, uh, right. aspiring uh, inventors and stuff. Whatever happened to this fellow's, uh, uh, you know, test materials and such? Documents. Documents. Spar Sparkies? Yes. You know, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what happened after he died. Um, yeah. He, 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 he he, he, yeah, I mean, he went into hiding. I know that, and so uh, I don't know. In the end, yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe Tom's got it. I really, you know, I really haven't kept up, let's say, as far yeah. as w in the aftermath of that, of exactly what happened. But uh, knowing the people, knowing the kind of threats he was receiving, et cetera, I doubt it was like, you know, come on and get this stuff, people. I don't think so. No, probably not. How about? Uh so there's other people you're aware of that have been in the field. Uh, Brown's gas. Now, when you say Brown's gas, what was that experiment like? What were they What were they working with, and what were they hoping to achieve? So Brown's gas is, um, in fact, there was a movie uh, made uh, uh, titled Chain Reaction, and Chain Reaction was actually a thinly veiled. Uh, it was it was Brown. It was about Brown. And in fact, uh, when Brown was in Southern California trying to make things happen, again, he had congressmen in his camp, et cetera. Um, some filmmakers picked his brains for a couple of days and said they were going to, you know, get him the money, et cetera. And a couple of years later, they made this movie <laughs> called Chain Reaction. That's the and, one with uh, Canna Reeves and Morgan yeah, Freeman. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, that, and in fact, if you, if you ever saw a picture of Brown and saw the scientists, you're like, huh, that's a kind of a knockoff on him. You know, and then, uh, you know, uh, China built a city for Brown. He had like 2,000 scientists working for him in a city that China built for him. And wow. uh, in the movie, you see him with this... 
Asian assistant, you know. So there was a lot of this kind of inside, you know, humor. Inside kind of joke thing. stuff, yeah. yeah they Who did was it, Keanu you know? Reeves playing? <laughs> Uh, he he wasn't playing Brown. He was playing the yeah. yeah I don't know. <laughs> I don't know who he was playing. I don't know in real life who that was supposed to be. But anyway, but they made they they literally used uh, Brown's gas and some of its uh, effects to be the premise for that movie. And uh, but anyway, so uh, the thing about Brown's gas is that it's just it's water, but it's water that's been you know split in a way that has these very unusual properties and and the um. You know, it can sublimate tungsten. I mean, you put this flame on, you can put it on your hand, it doesn't do anything, and then you can you can put it on a tungsten rod that supposedly has, you know, a, a melting point of 10,000 degrees and just, you know, and just vaporizes. And so, okay. very unusual stuff, and one of the effects that has been performed, and this, in fact, the Chinese government, the U.S. government, the U.K. government, and I think some other governments, I mean, this experiment's been carried out many times, and in fact, where you guys are in Canada, Andrew McCrouse, he's performed it a number of times. He's at a university up there in Ottawa. But uh, there is, um, it, it produces transmutational effects. And they, in fact, in the scientific realm, and again, it's, it's you know, sort of like supposedly some, you know, impossible thing. But they call them low-energy nuclear reactions, you know, cold fusion. It, it, these are all in this series of uh, reactions that... Sh- according to classical atomic theory, you shouldn't be able to do these things. You shouldn't be able to, you know, at the electron level, do something that's going to affect the nucleus. But, um, again, the, the Brown's gas effects uh, on uh, transmutation has been performed. I mean, I'm talking like 100 times or something. I mean, it's been performed okay. a lot. And, and okay. uh, so, anyway, but so anyway, we were actually, um, I spoke at Department of Energy hearings uh, with Dennis back in 1997 to get the try to get the uh, federal government to look into using Brown's gas to solve the nuclear waste problem. And uh, was that well received? Well, that was that's kind of a funny thing. So he and I spoke at the uh, Savannah facility down there in uh, South Carolina, where you know practically glows at night. I mean, literally, Atomic Boulevard was like the street where the hearings were held, and and the most excited person at the hearings was the DOE guy who ran the hearings. And and at the uh, lunch break, he came out and he, and uh, sort of followed us out the parking lot, and he. He said something I'll never forget. He, he he basically said we were the third group that attended these hearings and proposed a neutralization technology. And and then he said, you know, the people managing nuclear waste stand to make a lot of money managing nuclear waste. And if your answer doesn't make them a lot of money, you can forget it. You know, and, and this was and the so DOE he, guy. He told, you, he told you straight up. That. Yeah, it was, it was like, it was, and, and he actually, and then he hands us his card and he says, you know, I'm an underling with little power. I probably can't do much good, but I'll try, you know. And so, in fact, we did get a call from the DOE like a couple months later, you know, some, you know, junior clerk guy having to check the box, you know, of these guys who presented at the hearings. And, uh, but of course, it never went anywhere. And, uh, you know, no. anyway, but so we were involved with that stuff, you know, and Brown's gas, um, th- that is probably... I mean, that's a very interesting effect. And in fact, the whole low energy nuclear reactions, it, you know, some people might call that a Pandora's box. And that's kind of chain reaction. The movie was about Pandora's box, you know, blowing up a city, you know, right. uh, with, with this effect. But um, uh, anyway, on, a, on the science physics end of that, it really is a paradigm changer and uh, unusual. Again, in fact, Brown, I mean, there's theories about how it does it, but I don't think anybody really knows. You know, at least out here in the white world, you know right. exactly how it does what it does. And when by white world, you mean white hat, meaning... No, I just, I, I, I talk about white science and black science, you right, know. Right. So white science is the public, you know, peer-reviewed literature and this kind of stuff. The black stuff is the stuff that they demonstrate underground to select few. <laughs> right, right. That, that makes the textbooks look like cave drawings, you know. Yeah, so it's... it's the black, that, and that's, I, what, that's, what that, I, that's I unfortunate white. because the guys who are working with the cave dry, uh, drawings are the um, peer-reviewed scientists who comes out and say, well, this is not possible, and then they can pull out their fi- physics books and say exactly why it's not uh, possible and yes. wrong. <laughs> but yeah, they'll was, never it, know. It was the same guys who said the Wright brothers couldn't fly, you know, so yeah. you know, I hear that. And, and that's, a real, that's a real common uh, problem. That's something that, you know, Brian O'Leary has taken that 
you know, much further than I have trying to press into the scientific establishment on these issues. And again, Brian, of course, being an ex-astronaut, et cetera, an ex-Ivy League professor and all these things, I mean, he knew everybody. And so when he eventually, you know, completed his initial investigations into free energy technology, visited labs across the world, et cetera, he, he tried to be the Paul Revere of free energy, and he knocked on all the doors that, you know, he used to, institutions that it used to you know work at like princeton you know berkeley right, right. these places and and he found no takers you know anywhere yeah. everybody you know. backed right up yeah you know he and he had the smarts right i mean he had the the, the he physics had the, credential. Back, he he had had the physics background and everything yeah and brian had you know brian's seen a lot of stuff you know and and um now, I will say that Brian's not the guy who got that under, underground show, but Brian is aware of a lot of that kind of stuff, too. So he knows that there's black um, projects out there with Absolutely. advanced technology, and he's completely aware of and, it. And in fact, when I, when I first told Brian, and this is a long time ago, when I first told Brian about this show that my friend got, he goes, Oh, we got a show from the spooks, huh? <clears throat> Oh, so he knew and he, de- he identified with what uh, what it was about. Okay. Well, he just he was just kind of like, oh yeah, that you know. So <clears throat> yeah. So oh. anyway, I said in these circles, it's in these circles, it's not that unusual. Right. Um, it's not that unusual. Okay. How about um, Tom? Yeah, Adam. Adam. Uh, Trombley. Adam Trombley. Adam Trombley. Yeah. Oh, Trombley. Okay. Yeah. In fact, I have heard that uh, somebody is doing a documentary uh, that uh, is going to feature Adam. And I think a lot of us in this field are really, and we're really hopeful and eager. I mean, I'd, I'd stand in line to see that show, you know. And so Adam is, yeah, he's definitely one of the, well, I almost say a legendary figure in this field. You know, he's a scientist, his father, long story. I, I told some of those things last time, but Adam demonstrated his homopolar generator in New York City, downtown Manhattan, right after he and, talked to the United and, Nations. And what would that be? What would a what would a homopolar uh, homopolar gen- generator do? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's I think it's getting at the zero point field, like Sparky's thing is. I mean, if you, you read the, in fact, there's there's blueprints on the internet and this kind of stuff, and and it, basically it's tapping into the zero point field, and so it's another way of doing it. And um, this one has moving parts, though. You know, Sparky's was solid state. The Homo pole right. looked like it had moving parts. But I mean, pretty much all the uh, free energy technology is tapping into the zero point field, which is, and again, I you can really go down the rabbit hole of quantum physics and stuff here. But essentially, the zero point field is it's everywhere. It's kind of the, maybe the substrate of physical reality. And, uh, and it's had, in fact, Gene Manning's collected about 30 names over the years that various uh, inventors and theorists have used to just dis- to try to describe this field. And, yeah. They, I mean, they call it the etheric field. Yes. They call it the null point field. They call it the, yes. you know, there's a hundred names for it. All, exactly. And she's, she's collected 30 and, um, Anyway, I think it's all the same thing that, and again, it's a lot harder than it looks. It's not that easy to tap it, but it has been done. And I think at the Above Black World, is, I think they run their coffee makers on it, you know, so, but. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, look, at the back in the days, you know, there's a lot of people trying to get man in the air and keep them there. And now look what, you know, we got uh, so many planes crisscrossing the uh, over top of the earth that we need uh, global positioning satellites just to keep track of them all. Oh, absolutely. In fact, I was just reading uh, just this morning on uh, space junk, you know, and, <laughs> and how many pieces of space junk are out there floating around, you know. So, yeah, it's a lot up there. But um, anyway, so uh, Trombley demonstrated uh, his device uh, in New York City, and this, is, and this is almost 20 years ago, I think. And then, in fact, Adam is pretty... You won't, and that's that's why if there's a documentary, it's going to really have him tell the story. A lot of us are very anxious to hear it because I've heard bits and pieces of it, and it's it. I would say it might be more spectacular than Dennis's story, but it's 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 pretty amazing. Anyway, Adam though kind of downplays it and says, "Ah, my life became a bad spy novel after that," you know. But and he survived the experience. But uh, in fact, interview did about ten years ago. 
uh, he uh, he lives in Hawaii, and he had a new facility put up, and, and he's putting solar panels on it, and he's kind of joking, I mean, kind of in a depressed way about putting solar panels on this thing because he's had three of his technologies seized, I think, by the federal government. And so so there he is putting solar panels on his roof and kind of right. so chuckling at the absurdity of it. Of it. Yeah, how, how primitive. Yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. And so Trombley, yeah, so Trombley's a, yeah, he, Adam also had the goods. Adam was demonstrating it right in Manhattan and uh, and paid pretty heavy price for doing that. Okay, who else do you know that is from that time frame that was a big name besides Sparky and Adam and, and Back of in course, those days? Brian, Brian, Leary, Brian O'Leary and... Brian, um... Well... Oh, Bedini. Oh, Bedini okay. was a big name. Huge Yeah, name. and I'm... You know, and there's, in fact, De Palma. So you got De Palma. Yeah, that's true. You yep. guys. Um, in fact, Brian and his Globetrotters, uh, what, Tarawi, a guy in uh, India. It was actually, there's a guy in India who's... He's actually a pretty high-ranking scientist in the uh, India power... I mean, like the energy industry infrastructure there, and, and Brian's visited his labs a few times. And uh, you know, some other guy in Japan, can't remember his name. Brian visited him also. Um, again, somebody with a lot of establishment science credentials. And I, I'm sorry, I can't recall the name right now, but mm-hmm. but they're around, you know. And yeah. and some of these guys are still at it. I think you know? Medini's and, still at it, actually. Yeah, I think. And and, and so you get some that are still at it. Some. He made this 17-foot... Did you hear about that? He made a 17-foot uh, replica of a, of a Bedini motor. 17 feet high. Oh, no. Was it Bedini? I, I think it might have been. I know it was... Uh, I seen a YouTube video, and I couldn't believe it. It was it was insane how how many people were flocking around that. Wasn't there also... Um, like, I, I don't... I know you don't keep up with the new... Uh, the new stuff that's out there not so much not uh-huh. so much but you do you do still keep in somewhat in contact or at least lose contact with uh some of the older people that have been involved in it now a lot uh-huh. of them are just are they no longer working in the areas or are they just dead <laughs> well you, you know if how to say it only people like dennis lee will actually you know Pound it you know, out. Sp- yeah, spend a couple stints behind bars, you know, survive murder attempts, and then keep trying. I mean, I, I think Adam, after a few years of that, he finally said, I think I'm done now, you know, and, and he's, pretty, and he has been done. I mean, he's, right. he's pretty much, he doesn't do it any longer. And so, you know, once you've been through one or two of those experiences, you're kind of done. You, if I you guess survive what, the experience, you're kind of yeah. kind of done. Once they, Once you make a device and the government comes and steals it, then you make another one, and they come and steal it. And then you go, okay, one more shot. You make another one, they come and take that away from you. Well, I, at, that, well at that point, you're just like, what's the point? Well, oh, yeah, and point? actually, once they steal the first, I mean, the so-called steal, once they, but how to say, they don't okay. steal it. They use national securities laws to seize it, okay? Right. And then what happens is, is that you actually, they say, if you make one of these again, you go to prison. So then what you do is you make a different kind, <laughs> and then they classify that one too. So I think that's what – Adam may have gone through something like that. But anyway, so no, once, you, once they take away the first time, they pretty much say you don't pass go, and if, you, if we catch you making this particular one again, then uh, you and uh, Leavenworth Prison will become very close friends. And so uh, no, usually they try to do other – avenues that's my understanding but but again once you i mean like adam once he did the first one i mean he had a laboratory that had something like 20 million dollars of equipment in it and he came home and it was all gone you know and, and adam's going you know once they take all of your gear it kind of takes the wind out of your sails you know and and so anyway that's the thing it's like i've i've stood there as they carted off our stuff you know and and you know that kind of that takes the wind out of your sails, and not too many people can recover from that and, and try again, you know, and some do, but not many. So wait, uh, what's it going to take to get some of this stuff out, um, you know? In our in, lifetime. In our lifetime, yeah. In our lifetimes? Um, what's going to happen? Is, yeah, and that's, that, that's, a, that's a very, I think, an extremely important question. 
Um, the answers, you know, and I'll give you my perspective on that. Um, I, I do think, and I'm aware of, again, some of what's happening at the high levels. And I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not going to call myself a deeply connected insider. You know, in fact, some of the insider stuff is probably disinfo, but some right. of the stuff, but, but, but you hear things, you know, I, I hear things. And some of it, when, again, when a friend gets the underground demo, you know, you're kind of going, oh, okay, well, uh, that's no longer in the field. And that's no longer in the legendary, you know, <laughs> isn't really real category with me anymore. That moves over into that's real. Okay. Yeah, you're beyond you're beyond that whole questioning. I wonder if. Yeah, exactly. So you you have you see, you get to see enough. You're going okay. This stuff's real, you know. And, and then it becomes down to you know what is what's what are the odds or how to say what are the dynamics right now that right. are happening. And um, I my perception right now is that uh, like the people who demonstrated this other stuff long ago, uh, if. You know, if if the information that let's say Steve Greer has been receiving from some of these people is accurate, and again, the other scuttlebutt I've seen in the field leads me to believe that it probably is that it is very fragmented. They they do want this stuff to come out, and more of them do. And the let's say the holdouts are really holding out, and they're and that's kind of the real dark side of the force there. And I don't think anybody wants to openly defy them. Um, and, and I have this feeling that the near term outcome is going to be determined by what happens at those levels. Uh, unfortunately, I, I wish it wasn't that way, but I think, you know, if I, if you had to ask me to put money on it, if, if it's going to happen in our lifetime, I'm going to say that some dam is going to break at that level and we're going to see some stuff trickle down to us. That would be, that's my, if I had to put money on it. I would put my money on that. Now, I actually am trying to do something different, you know, and so I'm hoping to raise enough awareness to where, and in fact, one of the problems is, is that these deeply connected insiders, et cetera, there's kind of no place for them to go outside, you know, there's, you know, they, and again, you have now a number of them have gone on places like Camelot, et cetera, and I think that's what Carrie and Bill are trying to do, you know, is, is create kind of a, a, a home, a place where this, this stuff right come out and um and i think if more people were aware of not just that stuff but essentially how energy runs the ball game on earth you know and, and if we were really a more aware informed public about a lot of the real basic issues around energy and, and how our, our world operates i think it would really create a more fertile field for this stuff to to manifest uh and that's and that's what i'm trying to do um and this is I don't know. I don't know if it's. I don't know if it's going to be helpful at all. Yeah. But it's. But it's something that when I would see when when I was involved in these efforts and you and you're doing this Indiana Jones thing, and then you know when they got you in jail, there you are and you're being sprayed across the media. It's it's, it's like you don't have any allies then. I mean they they're all chased off, you know. And so I'm trying to build a a kind of a an infrastructure of awareness that can support you know, this kind of stuff coming forward. So, and again, that's not a, that's not sexy. It's kind of, it's not easy. It's, you know, it's not a spectacle, but I think it's needed. I mean, that's one thing I noticed was missing, you know, in, the, in these efforts was that. Right. So Wade, uh, why don't you give us your uh, website so people can uh, check it out. And read yeah, you got stuff. like 1,200 pages of at least, <laughs> at least of written information so, on there. So you can put my name into a search engine and it pops right up, you know, but also it's a healedplanet.net is the domain name. So, uh, right. and so that's the domain name. And, and yeah, there's 1,200 or so pages of material that took, you know, took a long time. Took about I think about twelve thousand hours of work is what I've kind of estimated. You know, it took to do that. Wow. So yeah. your your mission right now is to just get the word out there. And your new effort on Project Avalon, uh, mm -hmm. you've got a, a thread going there mm -hmm. called a, called uh, a healed planet that mm -hmm. you uh, you post in there all the time. You're talking to people uh, yeah. every and day. I've, yeah, and I've I've actually I've actually slowed down there just because. How to say it? The, the 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 writing that I'm hoping to achieve that can kind of help set the paradigm for what I'm trying to do 
I'm not getting it done. <laughs> so only so many hours in a day. So right now I'm trying to really focus on, on doing that. Well, and well, doing plus that. you're working like you're working like 16 hour days. Yeah, it's, it's a, I'm, yeah, my, my, uh, how to say it is, you, you know, do the, in fact, I, I figured it out. I, I probably spent like, you know, 10 years of my life for free doing this stuff and another 10 years of my life digging out of debt for that stuff. And so, you know, it doesn't leave much time left, you know, right. Uh, these yeah. things. And so, so anyway, you're not working in the, you're not like working in the energy field now, are you? You're no, no, no I'm not. I, I pretty much bowed out of that. Okay. In fact, my last stint with Dennis, that was kind of uh, the end, and I, I think I mentioned in the last show when I was with Dennis the last time, we were, we were targeted by an extremely sophisticated sting operation, probably mounted. I mean, the federal government was definitely a part of that. Uh, my experience uh, talking to people like Tom Bearden is that they're not really the masterminds, but they are the uh, muscle, you know, to, to, to do that stuff. And so once I realized that I came pretty close to going to prison my last stint with Dennis, I... This coward said, eh, that's, that's too rough. Oh, okay. 